Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. Frequently, people will say to me, I want to live a life that honors God, one that he is pleased with, having a praiseworthy testimony, but I struggle in accomplishing that. And to a certain degree, we can all say, yes, I can identify with that. So what's the solution for a believer? One who has received the gospel, one who acknowledges this book called the Bible is indeed the word of God, perfectly given to us without error. How can we rely upon that Holy Spirit in order to live such a life that God is pleased with? Well, one chapter in the Bible that is extremely practical and powerful in assisting us to live a life that is not in sin, but in the righteousness of God is Psalm 19. So with that said, to get your Bible, turn there, Psalm 19, and we're going to encounter a very powerful psalm that gives us spiritual truth in order to live a life that's pleasing to God and overcoming the pursuits, the schemes, the attacks of the enemy. When we learn this psalm, it will go a long way in helping us overcome temptation that we all struggle with from time to time. So Psalm 19, let's begin in verse 1. Now, again, this psalm is going to have that inscription, and the verses are going to be one off. So in this psalm, I'm just going to give you the Hebrew verse, what I'm looking at, and you'll have to make the own subtraction of one because in the English, it'll be one verse less, that number. Let's begin. In Hebrew, the first verse is, just three words, two, three Hebrew words, two, the chief musician, that choir director, the leader who is, the one who is leading people in reciting this psalm, chanting it, singing it in worship. So David's the author, it says, Mizborle David, a psalm of David. And he gives this to the chief music director so that it can be utilized by others in the worship of God. That's all which is contained in verse 1. Next verse, a very familiar one, where we read and it speaks about creation. One of the important things to know about creation. Now, there are very wise people scientists that studies the universe. They look at stars and different galaxies and such, and these people are very wise, but the problem is that the vast majority have not learned the foundational message of creation. And what is that? Well, look at this verse where it says, the heavens. And the next word, and remember, this is a psalm, one of the most characteristic aspects of a psalm is poetry. And poetry in Hebrew is parallelism. And we're going to see one thing relating to another. Here we have the word mesaprim, which is to tell. It is the verb where the, book, where the word book is derived from. So the heavens declare, they tell, like telling a story. And what do the heavens declare? What do they say? 
Well, they speak concerning the glory of God. So when one looks at creation, and we're speaking about gazing upon the, the space, the stars, the moons, those things in the universe that we see from earth. When we learn them, we find that there's an order, that there's a purpose, that they are in place. And that speaks about the wisdom, the knowledge, the perfection of God. One of the things that a astronomer will tell you about about the uh, outer space is that it is not helter skelter it's not just random but when we look at the universe there is an order to it and therefore that order speaks of the glory of God once more the first part of our verse the heavens tell of declare the glory of God and the work of his hands and this tells us that it was God's hands that formed the heavens, that he is the creator. The work of his hands, and we have a different word, similar to the word mesaprim, but this is the word magid. It's a word for announcing, declaring, telling, very similar. It is a synonym of lesaper, this word lagid. And who tells? Well, it is the Harakia. So we have Hashemaim, the heavens. Harakia is just another word that relates to the, the sky, what we could call the heavens, the lower heavens. So once more, when we stand upon earth and we look and we pay attention to what we see in the heavens, in the sky, we see that it's not haphazardly there. There is a purpose. There is an order. And this reveals God who is majestic. It tells his glory. Verse, verse 3 in the Hebrew. Yom le yom. A consistency. Day to day expresses, and this is a word for speech. And it's to tell us that creation came into being by God's word. He spoke. Similarly, we don't see, as some false teachers teach, that God created, for example, the, the individuals who believe that, that the word of God does not speak about an afterlife, a future, does not see anything miraculous in the word of God. Such views go along with those who teach incorrectly that God created and he stepped away, that he removes himself from creation. This is not what we see. When we look at the word of God, it says day to day, his speech is expressed. And we see that the universe, God's creation, in Hebrew, the term yakum, is not speaking about a static, a non-changing, but constantly being changed and maintained by God. God speaks and it is. Furthermore, it says, and light to night. And this is a word for also expressing, we could say, tells or declares knowledge. Now, here's what we derive when we pay attention to the laws of Hebrew poetry when we look at the parallelism we see something God's speech well let me ask you a question when you look at this verse what is the parallel word with speech it is word knowledge so the conclusion is this God's speech provides knowledge so when I teach for example a class on biblical interpretation and we study Hebrew poetry, I'll ask a question. What's parallel with day to day? Well, everyone knows night to night. What's parallel with the word yabia to express? It is the word yechave. And therefore, that same truth about how words are parallel for one another 
This reveals that through the speech of God, the word of God, the utterance of God comes knowledge. That's how we should interpret this. Look now to the next verse. And Omer, there is no speech, and here again, God's speech. There is no speech, and there is no words that what? Without being heard, their voice. Now, what it means is you cannot appreciate, hear, respond, benefit from the speech, from the words of God if you're not listening to their voice. And this word for listening means to hear with a response. Not simply letting these words come into your mind, enter into your ear, but upon hearing, there is a desire to obey. So we're not going to grasp what God has for us unless we're willing to obey what he reveals. Next verse, verse 5 in Hebrew, 4 in English. In all the earth goes forth their lines. Now, this is speaking about, again, it's a word of order. Think about someone who is building, for example, a home, and oftentimes you see strings put forth marking something what it will be. And this is what we see here. God has an order to his creation. He's laid things out. So we read, in all the earth goes forth their lines. And in the end of the earth is their words. Now, what do we learn from here? Their lines and their words. Lines speak about what God uh, basically puts down. His order, his will, before it is fulfilled. It's kind of like the blueprint. And what causes the fulfillment of that blueprint? Well, what's parallel to this word, their lines? Their words. So it simply underscores the fact that it's through God's spoken word that the outcome of his will is realized, made to be. It becomes that which is manifested, completed. So the word of God, we see how important his word is in bringing about the reality of his will. Continuing on to the son, he puts a tent in them. Now, what does that mean? Well, in them, we're talking about the earth, when we go to the first part, Bekoha Arts in all the world. And then what we lo- learn here is the sun, which is speaking about the heavens. So he places his dwelling place, his tent, in them, in the earth and in the heavens. What is this speaking of? Here again, teaching a class on biblical interpretation, I would ask the question. What attribute, divine characteristic, does this verse, the one we're looking at, verse 5 in Hebrew 4 in English, speaks to? It speaks to, at the end, God's omnipresent. He places his tent both in the heavens and the earth, meaning God is everywhere. And therefore, his word, his order, should rule everywhere now what's interesting is nature subjects itself to god's will but the question is what about you and me what about humanity humanity when we look at the book of genesis it is the supreme part of creation humanity the last part of creation and we have a, a what's called a pitgam, a saying in Hebrew. The, the end of something is really the first in the thought. Meaning, you want to achieve something, you have to do all the things that lead up to it. So it's when it is finished that we have the purpose. 
It is when God finished with humanity the creation on the sixth day that the purpose of creation was, was established. He made this world for us in order that we could experience him. That's the part of creation that we need to realize. Move on to verse 6 in Hebrew, 5 in English. He, here again, still speaking about knowing God, appreciating God more. And it says, he, like a groom. Now, in a biblically-based wedding, traditionally speaking, this is why I say biblically-based, because we have a, a description of it, that the groom who's underneath the marriage canopy, when the bride comes, he goes out unto her. And this is joyful for him. It signifies them coming together in this covenant of marriage. So we use that illustration to, to depict God here when it says, he is like a groom that goes forth from his chupa, his canopy. It is a, a speech of joy. And then it says, and rejoices as the mighty one. This can be the word hero. It speaks about a mighty warrior as he runs on the journey that way. Meaning this, a, a mighty warrior, he knows that when he travels down that pathway for battle, it is a pathway to victory. So God rejoices in the victory that his covenant, this marriage covenant I'm speaking about, a marriage between humanity and God. The victory that this brings about because God is the keeper of this new covenant. Verse 7 in Hebrew, 6 in English. Mikseh HaShemayim Motza'o. Now, from the ends of the heavens is his going forth. And it simply speaks about the fact that God, he goes forth. His origin is beyond what we can understand. And we know why. Because in the same way that God is omnipresent, he exists all places. God's origin is eternal. So from the ends of heaven you go there, the God is still present. He is eternal. So from the ends of his going forth and his circuits unto their end. So now it speaks once more about God who is eternal, is also everywhere. Everything is under his domain. In the scripture, we see that God has not disconnected with, with creation, but he is intimately involved in all of his creation. Does he transcend it? Yes, he does. But he's also within it. So both of those two things are factual. God can transcend his trans tr creation, but he can also be within it. Now let's look at the end of, of verse 7 in the Hebrew, verse 6 in English. And nistar me chamato. There is nothing hidden from, and some Bible will translate this, his terror, the fear that he brings, its word heat. And it's oftentimes a, a, a statement of his judgment. It is because God is everywhere that nothing escapes his judgment. God is going to put forth heat, and that heat is going to have one or two outcomes. It will either melt into destruction or it will be refining and perfecting. That's what God does. There is either destruction or there is redemption. And that redemption produces in the end that which is pleasing to God. So all of these principles are here within this text. And we're coming to, once we understand God's nature, his attributes, how he functions, then we are in a position whereby we can respond to this truth. 
and see change. And this is how we began our study. That we want change, a godly change in our life. Now look at verse 8 in the Hebrew, 7 in English. We don't go too far until we come to Torah Hashem, the law of God. And let me just simply say, and I realize this is not popular for most of Christianity. And people hear this and they make a wrong accusation of legalism. This is not legalism. This is spirituality. When we, in maturity, agree with God and want to apply His instructions, His words to our life. What I have found in, in teaching is if I say the Word of God contains wisdom that if you apply His Word to your life, you'll find blessing. People will applaud that. Yes, I agree with that. But then if I say, if you apply his laws, his commandments, which also contain wisdom to your life, you will find blessing. They scream legalism. And that's simply a, a attestment of spiritual immaturity. The law of God is good. In fact, the law of God was made for the spiritual one. The one who is not spiritual, all that the law of God can tell that person is, is, is that they're in need of redemption, that they are guilty before God, that they are a sinner. But for the one who is redeemed by God's grace, the word of God, the law of God, the commandments of God, the instructions of God, they contain wisdom that lead us into those things that are pleasing to God. Look at this text. The law of the Lord is burdensome. Is that what it says? Is legalism. Is bondage. Is that what the word of God says? No, it says, Torah Hashem Tmima. That is a word of, of perfection. It's a word that brings us to the end, meaning the end that God wants us to have. And the word end can show the, the destination, the goal, the purpose. That's what we're talking about here. The law of God brings that about. Now, here's the key. It brings it about by defining the, the objective. It's the Spirit of God that empowers that, produces it. But the law of God gives us the right perspective. It also says, Meshivat Nefesh. It restores the soul. Now, do you hear that? We don't see legalism. Legalism is this. You have to do this to be saved. We're not talking about that. We're speaking to people who have received the grace of God, who have been saved and are eternally secure in this eternal redemption, this eternal salvation by the grace of God, not of works. Having been put in Messiah, being in Messiah, we find that God's instruction restores the soul. That's what he's saying here. And the testimony of the Lord, now we see something. Here again, let's go back to a course of biblical interpretation. If I say, what's parallel in this verse with the phrase, Torah Hashem, the law, the Torah of the Lord? What would be the only answer? Edut Hashem, the testimony of the law or the Lord. So the Lord's testimony is the Lord's law. There's absolutely no other answer, any other way to interpret this. So the law of God is the testimony of God. And he says here, it is faithful. We see a correlation between the testimony of the Lord, the law of the Lord, which brings about perfection. That's its objective. It defines what is perfect. Now, the law in and of itself can't change a person. The law, and if you study the book of Romans, you'll find this. The law is not an instrument of justification. It doesn't produce it. It doesn't make it, but it 
identifies, it sets the standards, it defines what is righteous, what is, what is the, the, the one who has been justified, what is his objectives. And this is what the scripture is saying here. The testimony of the Lord is faithful. And notice something else. It makes wise the simple one. Now, the simple one is one who is easily, and if you do a good study of this word, you'll find this to be the case. This is a simple one, but it's one that easily succumbs to temptation. So what is the solution? The testimony, the law of the Lord. When we understand God's instruction, we're not going to be deceived. Understand. That temptation is, is usually accompanied with satanic deception. I want to say that again. A very important principle. When I am experiencing temptation, that temptation, what I can expect is satanic deception to come along with it. And if I don't know the objective, the purposes of God, if I don't know what is perfect in the eyes of God, the destination for a believer, how I should live, how I should think. If I don't know that, then I'm going to easily be deceived. Look to the next verse. Not only are we talking about the law of the Lord, but notice Pikude Hashem, which is another word for Oftentimes, we, we translate it as a synonym for the word mitzvah, commandment. The word pikudim are also commandments. But they have the word of, or they have the concept of a, a charge, a, a statement that God makes, an assignment to be carried out. So it says, the charges, the assignments, the commandments of the Lord are what? Well, we have the word yesharim, or straight or upright. And when we apply these commandments to our life, it puts us on that straight way. It produces uprightness in our life. And what's the outcome of that? When I am walking in that straight way, when I'm living uprightly before God, that produces me samche lev. It makes glad the heart. So if you want to live a, and be glad and live a life that is full of gladness, then you need to take hold of the, the commandments of God. It's just that simple. Not for the purpose of salvation, but for being a person who has been saved, that they can experience the gladness of, of the Lord. And then we have what's parallel with the term pikude Hashem, Mitzvah Hashem. Many of you know the word mitzvah, commandment. So the commandments of the Lord, instead of here in the first part it says upright or straight, now we have the word bara. Bara comes from a Hebrew word which relates to purity. And this purity is in an original sense. They bring about a purity that God originally intended for humanity to express. It's a state of being which is right for, for humanity. What God created humanity to be in, and notice something else. That purity does something. There's an outcome. May irat enayim. It illuminates our eyes. It gives us a different perspective. So all of these things, when we take hold of God's instructions, his charges, his commandments, his, his testimony, when we apply that to our life and, and begin to submit to it and pursue his objectives where he wants us to arrive to, this uprightness, this purity, what's the outcome? God is going to give us illumination. We can say it in a different way. He is going to give us revelation. And that's what he's talking about at the end of verse 9 in the Hebrew text, verse 8 in the English. Next verse. Yerat Adonai. We see over and over when we look the law of the Lord, the commandments of the Lord, the testimony of the Lord, the commandments of the Lord, and now the fear 
of the Lord. We might be able to say it is one's allegiance to the instructions, the testimony, the charges, the instructions, the commandments of God that, that demonstrates the fear of the Lord, that we give God priority. And that produces, it's a different word, for purity. It is parallel here to that same word, bara. Now we have the word tehora, purity. And the difference is this. That first word, we'll put it in the masculine singer, the word bar, not to be confused with the word bar, which is Aramaic for son. This is a word for purity in an original state, a pristine, how God wanted us to be. That's bar. When we look at the word tahor, this word, again, in the third person singular, what we find it, what we find is this, that, that tahor is the state of being, it's purity, but what's unique is it puts us in a state of being where the blessings of God can come upon us. So we see a correlation between the fear of the Lord and being blessed by God. When you make God your priority, you will find blessing. It says, the fear of the Lord is pure and it stands forever. And this word stands, it's very, very important because one of the things you will learn if you study Hebrew is that when we look at what some will call the participle form, others will simply say the simple present tense in Hebrew, when it's used, and it's used infrequently, by and large, the perfect and imperfect is used. Not to be confused with the perfect and imperfect in Greek. In Hebrew, the perfect and imperfect is more of the, the past and the future. And when the present is used, it marks it, it's rare, it highlights something. So it is this fear of the Lord which produces a purity that brings God's blessings, and this is a promise that stands forever. Next, next part of verse 10. And the judgments of the Lord, they are true. And, and they make righteousness altogether. Now, the word here for righteousness is simply the state of being. When we apply the truth of God, his judgments, his decisions in the situation, that truth produces righteousness. And the last part of this word, yachdav, all together. And this word means without exception. God's truth is relevant. It is truth. For every situation at all times, it is never unusable. It is never something that should be set aside. God's truth is always, always relevant and right for the situation. And when it does is utilize, it produces altogether righteousness. Look now at verse 11 in the Hebrew, 10 in English. Speaking about these things, what things? All that we talked about, the law of the Lord, the testimony of the Lord, the charges of the Lord, the commandments of the Lord, the fear of the Lord, the judgments of the Lord. It says, ha nachbadim. This is a word for desirable. Now, we need to be, to be careful because normally when we hear the word covet, we think of a negative thing. But the biblical word covet can be used both in a positive and a negative. Thou shall not covet, but it's what you're coveting, what you're desiring. You can covet that which is good, and it's usually just translated, you have a desire. So we should desire, it's a strong word. The word covet is a strong word. Same word here, just used in a positive sense. So these things are desirable. What are? The word of God says his laws, his testimonies, his judgments, his commandments, his fear. These are desirable. And then we have a word, more. More desirable than gold and even fine gold, an abundant fine gold. And they are sweeter than honey 
and the honeycomb. Even the source of that honey, they're sweeter of, they're preferable. And that's what he's saying. When we look at that which is precious in the world or sweet, sweet being associated with joy, we find that the law of the Lord, the fear of God, they are more desirable than the most precious thing, the most joyful thing in humanity, in this world. That's the mindset that we have to have. And we, when we have such a mindset, it is going to produce a radical change in our spirituality. How we live, how we think, all of that is going to be altered in a positive way. Look now to, to verse 12, 11 in English. He says, also your servant. Now here, David is making it very personal. Also, your servant is speaking about himself, but it's true for every servant of God. Also, your servant, he is cautious in them. He's warned in them. Now, we don't want to, to do things that are dangerous, that are harmful. And it's good that there are warnings. And what David is telling is this, for the servant of God, not for the unbeliever, but for the servant of God, these commandments, these laws, these testimonies, this fear of the Lord, when, when we are cautious in them, they do something. They produce what we want. And what is that? It says, verse, verse 12, when they are kept, when keeping them, there is ekev rav a great reward. Now, I want us to pause for a moment because we are in a verse of great relevance. And it really shows how oftentimes people are insincere. And this insincerity, insincerity is often based in a spiritual anti-Semitism. Now, let me share with you an example. If you go to most places and you come to the word for the name Jacob, they will tell you that Jacob means a deceiver. They'll use that old English word, a surplanter, one who is a deceiver, a false one. But here's the problem. I always say it, that's a falseness. That is not true. Because the word Yaakov, Jacob, means one who follows after and pursues and pursues something. The implication is a reward. Now, if you look at the end of our verse, here again, 12 in the Hebrew text, 11 in English, where it says, let me just read all the verse, also your servant is, is cautious in them or is worn by them. When he keeps them, ekev rav, there is a great reward. Now, I know your Bible, regardless of what translation you're using, it translates a word as reward. How do I know that? Because I checked over 30 English translations, over 30, and every one of them, you can go to Bible Hub, and you can look at this word, this, this verse, all 29 translations that they give, they have all of them, the word reward. And what is this reward? Well, this word for reward is ein kuf veit. It is that same word that the name Jacob comes from. So let me ask you a question. How can they translate this as a reward? And what does it mean? It's when you work, you labor, you pursue something, and it's a result, a result that's positive. It is that same word that can be translated heal. Remember the example that I've given to you? Jacob was grasping the heel of, of Esau. Because he wanted the reward. Why? What's the message? Well, in Judaism, it is when the heel comes out, when one is born, that child, the right of the firstborn, 
is not given until the heel comes out. So the term heel, eketh, can also mean reward. It produces the result. It's translated wonderfully here. My question is, for those who believe that Jacob means surplant or deceiver, one who is false, one who is unethical, how can that same word be translated reward? It can't be if it means deceiver or surplanter. But the truth of the matter is, it doesn't. This is a false concept, a wrong definition that is superimposed upon Jacob. And anyone that knows Hebrew and studies it seriously realizes this. That's why this verse is so important. Also, your servant, he is warned by them. He is cautious with the word of God, the commandments of God, the instruction of God. And when he keeps them, there is a great reward. Ekev Rav. Verse 13. Here again, very practical piece of scripture. Shigiot. What are Shigiot? Heirs. But usually there are heirs that are unintentional. Heirs that we, we don't do something trying to be wrong, but we make a mistake. But a, a spiritual mistake, even though we did not have intent, it is still sinful. It is still a transgression. So he says, such heirs, who can understand? Sometimes we just say to ourselves, how did I do that? What was I thinking? How could I have said this, done this, behaved this way, made this decision? It just, it's beyond comprehension. And that's what David is saying. Such heirs, who can understand? And, and he says, from such hidden things, maybe things that we don't even know that we've done that are wrong. He says, clean me. David wants to be made cleansed from everything that is impure, everything that is unrighteous. He also says, look at the next verse, also from, and this is used in contrast, the word shkiot, remember? Actions that are wrong, but without intent. Now, in this verse, verse 14 in the Hebrew text, 13 in, 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 in English, also from, and Zadim are intentional. When I rebel, willfully reject God's instruction and do a sin, what does David say? He says, save me. And this is not the word for salvation. This is a word which means to withhold. So stop, hinder your servant from doing those things that are willfully wrong. Why? He says, in order that they should not rule or have dominion over me. And when we don't have this, this rebellious spirit ruling over us, what will we be? Then he says, I will be perfect. He will arrive at the, the location, the behavior, the mindset that God intended. A, a servant of God to be. And a servant of God is what God intends for all humanity to be. Few find it, but that's the intention. That's the standard. He says, and I will be cleansed from abundant transgression. Now, here's the message. You are either going to be in one or two situations. You are either going to have abundant transgression or an abundant reward because God's either going to work in your life or you're going to be rejected by him so strive to be this one putting in these principles understanding God his attributes he is omnipresent he knows everything he is all-powerful although he transgress or transcends creation he's also within creation and his ways are perfect. His ways are restoration. His ways give insight. They are illumination. They produce a right outcome in our life. And that's why it says, I will be cleansed from abundant transgression. Last verse, 14 in English, 15 in Hebrew. Something that we, we frequently hear. David says, 
which means, may the words of my mouth be to your delight. Your word, ratzon, literally means will. And it could be an, an imploring of this, but uh, a good friend of mine says that he never likes to translate the future as may it be, be but it will be. We should see it as an assurance. So if we translate it this way, the words of my mouth will be, if we follow this, they will be to God's will. We'll have an agreement with God. And the, most Bible says, the meditations of my heart, but this is a word for also that which is logical. When we have this attitude, applying God's truth to our life, what our heart thinks will be logically right in God's eyes. So the meditations of my heart, what my heart pronounces, may they be before you, O Lord. Meaning may they be acceptable, may they be right, or they will be proper, they will be under your, your will, your purposes. And then he says, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer and it just shows how my rock rock a sure foundation and the way that we find that sure foundation is through the redemption that only messiah yeshua that is christ jesus can present to us he presents it and we receive it by faith that is his grace we take hold of it through faith that we might truly be an individual that has a praiseworthy testimony, one that God is well pleased with. And that's the objective that David had, and that should be yours and my objective as well. Well, with that, I'll close until next week. Shalom from Israel. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel. Thank you.